is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. We have with us at Wizard via Zoom, Latrice Clark of the Truth Telling Project. How are you today, Latrice? Good morning, I'm well, thanks. How are you? Very, very well. We're so glad to have you with us because um, we've been reading as a part of our program because uh, our program today is uh, my show is focusing on truth. And then we read, um, I don't know if you were able to tune in earlier, we were reading from the article. Um, what was the name of the article again? It's um, uh, from David Raglan. Uh, from Counterpunch, uh, it was an article in uh, 2015 called Challenging the Silence Racism Creates. So we were just, uh, 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 letting the, our listeners know a little bit more about the Truth Telling Project and then of course, um, uh, your work and uh, addressing, addressing the silence. So, um, so who founded the Truth Telling Project, Latrice? Well, um, as you mentioned, one of the co-founders was David Ragland, Dr. David Ragland, um, the Congresswoman, Corey Bush is also a co-founder, Dr. Armani Scott and a few others. So there was a group of individuals who were on the ground in Ferguson from St. Louis. Um, and it originated out of, you know, in response to the killing of Mike Brown Jr. And so a group of community organizer organizers at the time came together and decided to start the Truth Telling Project. Yes, how, um, how long between the death of uh, Michael Brown and uh, the start of the Truth Telling Project, how, how quickly did, uh, did all of you um, come together and, and start this project? Oh, that's a good question. I'd say that it, it, it started in 2015, but I want to say it's an ongoing process that, <laughs> that it took for it to actually come together. You know, when you're starting a nonprofit, uh, it takes time to build the relationships. It takes time to develop. Um, exactly. and, and, you know, you have volunteers and things of that nature. So I want to say around 2017 is when things really started to sort of coalesce and become more um, uh, structured, I guess, in a sense to say, but uh, I, I'd say right away the, from the ground, the activists and things of that nature were, were working to, uh, in response to the community and police violence that was happening in Ferguson. So at that time, uh, how, what was the uh, Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, at what stage was it at that time and did you work with uh, Black Lives Matter? So we did not have a direct connection with Black Lives Matter. So I, I can't really speak to where the movement was at the time in Ferguson when um, the Truth Telling Project was, was being originated, but it was a, a community-based grassroots led, so very much so on the ground in Ferguson. I know Black Lives Matter became sort of more of a national movement a lot, a lot sooner and took off a lot quicker. But um, those individuals, Dr. Raglan and things like that, who are from St. Louis on the ground, they were working with the community organizers there in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and they originally actually started as um, a truth telling and the Community Institute on Truth and Reconciliation, but there was pushback from the community in regards to reconciliation, right? Like sometimes people wanna jump to conclusions and, and, and problem solving without necessarily listening to, you know, the stories and the way that the violence and racism is impacting people. And so it moved from that being the Community Institute on Truth and Reconciliation to focusing on truth telling projects, which is how the name of Truth Telling Project came about. So in other words, you, uh, you're saying that um, uh, the community didn't recognize uh, that there, there was truth that, well, a certain portion of the community did not recognize that there was truth to be told and they were pushing back against this truth. The, yes, exactly. And uh, so this, um, so the movement originated in, uh, in uh, Ferguson or in St. Louis. Yes. And, and it, and yes, yeah, so um, St. Louis is sort of the, the hub, right? The community mm -hmm. organizers, that's where um, the individuals who co-founded the organization decided to, to get things going. But and Ferguson is where the event with Mike Brown started. Obviously. Of course. So they were on the ground there as well. Yes, yes. 
how did the name uh, True Telling Project originate? That was sort of the story that I was just telling, um, kind of moving from being that community institute on truth and reconciliation to focusing more on truth since there was pushback from that. So the truth telling project is originated from, from that to focus on the truth telling process. Got it. So um, in other words, you wanted to find um, solutions and, um, and try to approach reconciliation, but there was pushback because there, um, uh, there didn't seem to be any need for reconciliation. Uh, for some of the some segments of the population, right? Is that what you're saying? So, right. You you can't necessarily have reconciliation without truth telling, right? You can't necessarily jump to a solution without necessarily hearing the the different ways and that racism, structural violence, and things are impacting people in the community. And so mm -hmm. the focus was more on the the reconciliation, but without the truth telling. So um, the need came for putting together the truth and tell, uh, reconciliation, that commission, putting together a truth telling process for people who were directly impacted by police violence um, and, and hearing those stories as part of that healing process. When um, the, those uh, people that pushed back um, against uh, reconciliation because they did not understand the truth, once those people heard of the truth, did, uh, did any of them, did, do you know if any of them changed and, uh, and then understood that uh, there was this truth that they didn't recognize before? Um, I can't necessarily speak to that, you know, without directly hearing from those individuals, but I would say the, the truth telling process that was created uh, actually took place. We had people like Sandra Bland, you know, other families that have been impacted by violence and, and it was a powerful thing, right? The individuals that were there, they mm -hmm. were deeply moved, right? It created that sense of not being in, alone. You have that community, you have support. And so that's kind of what we aim to do, right? The mission of the Truth Telling Project is to uplift um, and implement grassroots community-centered truth-telling processes that amplify the voices that are traditionally silenced, right? Disenfranchised, um, vulnerable in response to direct and indirect state station violence. And so that's really what we try to do is, is bring those stories forward, create a community of support and support individuals on the ground that are doing this work, as well as others um, to, to help people see that this is a needed and, and how we can move forward, right? Together um, as a community. Yeah, what, what I liked was that maybe I, maybe I wasn't clear enough, but I think that uh, some people, they just didn't understand how, um, how deep this uh, silence was. And then uh, I was just wondering if uh, you had some uh, people who became your allies, whereas before they, were, uh, they did not uh, understand what the truth was. Oh, I see, I see. So I um, have been a part of the Truth Telling Project more recently. I was not on the ground at that specific commission, so I can't really say, but from the programs and things that I have been a part of since, absolutely. We have people who are helping to organize. We have one of the programs of the Truth Telling Project, which is a grassroots reparations campaign. People, um, we, we have faith-based and ethically centered organizations from across the nation um, come to us and they are looking to organize reparation, for reparations locally on the ground within their own community. So we certainly have with people who join our reparations course that we do, um, individuals who are becoming more and more interested. We help organize um, for HR 40, which is the bill to, um, is being debated in Congress uh, to pass a commission to study reparations and the history and what that would look like. So for individuals in, and black individuals in America. So we definitely have people that, that support the work and are coming around and are learning and wanting to learn more political, get it politically educated around reparations and things that they can do to support the movement. How did you come to become involved in the Truth Telling Project? I came, uh, became involved in the Truth Telling Project actually through knowing Dave Raglan, the co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, in my PhD program, he was one of my professors and actually talked about his work. And so we stayed in contact. I started volunteering for his organization and recently um, became one of the co-executive directors for the, for the Truth Telling Project. Did you ever, um, were you ever one of the uh, radical truth tellers? 
I was not, no, one of the, <laughs> personally, one of the radical truth tellers, but um, we definitely uplift those as well. Every month we do have uh, people that we reach out to and it's just in conjunction with, you know, board members. We try to uplift those people on the ground that are not traditionally high spotlighted, right? They're doing the work, but um, they're not maybe having as much national support and attention as needed. And so we just try to look for those folks who, who have done or continue to do, um, you know, grassroots, community activism, whatever that may be, right? Scholars, not always necessarily um, people who are considered themselves activists, but they're, the work that they're doing in the world is should be highlighted and we try to uplift them and give them a platform to support their work. What was uh, the uh, your, your thesis about for your PhD? Can you tell us? <laughs> oh, that's still in process. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, yes, I am still in school and working on that. My, but um, it definitely would be something around work that I'm doing, grassroots liberation. And okay. What are some of the programs of the Truth Telling Project? So one of them is It's Time to Listen, and that is where we actually have the stories that we've collected from people who are impacted by um, police violence. And we're looking to, um, we're currently working on the website to, to get those stories back up for people to, to view and listen to. But we are also thinking about creating a curriculum for teachers to teach in um, schools about police violence, structural violence, and the ways that racism is impacting um, people of color. Another program is one that I mentioned, the Grassroots Reparations which also um, seeks to uh, support people on the ground who are doing reparations work. Um, what grade levels, uh, when you said that uh, you're planning to uh, provide courses for uh, teachers to, uh, to uh, uh, introduce students to uh, truth telling, uh, what grade levels are, are you um, focusing on? So that would definitely be, you know, um, not necessarily at the college level, but like secondary, you know, K through 12 or whatever age appropriate that middle school and things where teachers would want to um, introduce that topic for students. Is there any talk at all of uh, very young children? Because uh, I think that uh, we see that that, uh, that kind of uh, structured racism exists uh, very early uh, in, 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 in one's life. Um, is there, uh, do you know of any work that uh, actually uh, uh, tries to bring this reality, this status quo and uh, to, uh, to uh, very young students or is this too, uh, uh, too frightening for them, the material? You're saying, is it, is it something that should be introduced to young children? Yes, and has it, be, has it been introduced? Are you thinking about introducing it to very young children? I see. So we support educators. That decision would be up to them of whether or not they want to Im implement that curriculum into their classrooms. But I, I, I definitely believe that the earlier that you are able to introduce these concepts, the better, right? The, the tools that you can give students to deal with these situations and to react in a, a positive way with one another, that, that can only, you know, down the line, help them and help us all together work together and, and understand how our actions can impact each other. This might seem a kind of a general question. However, uh, you've, you've uh, brought in a lot of uh, family members of people who were impacted by police violence, uh, such as you know, um, surviving family members. What are the commonalities among these uh, people with these experiences do you find? Um, that, that is a very... Um, I'm not really sure exactly how to answer that. <laughs> okay, just try you your best. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, because um, you're you're in the best position. I've always wanted to. I understand the general commonalities, but I think since uh, you're so involved in in the project, that you will see beyond what we see on the surface. Um, I it. it the reason why that question is so difficult is because I can't necessarily point to one thing, right? Like each uh, individual who, the stories that we hear on the news that have been um, affected by 
police violence and things of that nature. It was for very different reasons, right? And, and, and underlyingly, it's all related to prejudice, right? Our, our, our bias and, and racism. And so um, I can't necessarily point to one thing as being uh, a commonality. It, it can because it was literally as simple as, you know, jogging in your neighborhood, walking your dog, um, you know, having a taillight out on the back of your car. Like there, there wasn't any specific reason out of the ordinary that these people were targeted or, you know, had had this experience. It was just really um, that the type of uh, racism that they experienced because they were being black in that situation. That that's that's the one thing that I can <laughs> I can point to, right? Um, there's really nothing sort of deeper than that. And uh, is there any research? Uh, do you know that um, that uh, can probe as to the true numbers of uh, excessive force and uh, and uh, and death and uh, injury from uh, police violence toward uh, toward uh, people uh, people of color? Because a lot of it is it's not reported, probably. It's definitely underreported. And then also the way that these, the system is set up, right? The way that it's designed, it's a good old boys club, right? They protect each other. And so a lot of the times, if you do come forward with a complaint in certain communities, right? Um, that opens you up for retaliation, that opens you up to be targeted in, in many different ways. And so that also um, contributes to the underreporting because you don't want that target on your back for speaking up about you know, a police officer that's harassing your community when they're protected by that institution. Mm -hmm. Do you have any uh, police allies, police that uh, really don't, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, subscribe to this kind of uh, status quo helping you at all? Um, not directly, no. Um, there was an invitation that was extended during that truth-telling process that took place in, in Ferguson. However, I don't believe anyone from the, representing that side um, decided to, to show up in support. It was only the families who were impacted um, by that violence. And so that's something that we can definitely move towards and sort of seeking those partnerships. We're always looking for collaborations in ways that we can, um, you know, have allies and, and bring people on to the movement. So that's something we're open to. But as of yet, no, we have not established that relationship. That's the reason I asked is that, uh, you know, in Chicago, there was the Laquan McDonald shooting and, and, and killing. And uh, the only reason that uh, we know about it is that uh, a police officer stepped forward uh, anonymously to uh, because he felt he or she felt very uncomfortable about it and uh, and uh, went to uh, uh, Jamie uh, uh, Kaplan I can't remember his uh, Kaplan uh, Kelvin Jamie Kelvin the the uh, who who broke the story because uh, this uh, police officer came to him to to uh, to whistleblow. And those individuals are often in, in hard situations themselves, right? There's been stories that come out of people who were police officers and they and they did tell on their partner or whoever, and they were, ended up leaving the force, fired or chose to leave for whatever reason because um, of the pushback that they received. So uh, it, it's very hard to, to tell the truth, right? You're not always going to be well-received. You're gonna have pushback. You're gonna have a target on your back. And so, um, not many individuals are willing to, to do that and, and it becomes harder to reconcile in that situation, right? Because we have individuals that are not willing or are not able to come forward, right? They're, they're, there's all this pressure um, or threats and you're in a position where, especially if you have families and things of that nature, you have to think of that first, right? And, and it's like, how, how can you tell the truth when even though it's the right thing to do, but it, it might cause some sort of harm to you personally. So um, there's that element to it as well. How extensive how is the, how, how far is the reach of the Truth Telling Project in the US? It's growing, I'd say, especially with our grassroots uh, reparations campaign movement. We have people who are supporting um, in different uh, states nationally, and we're still mapping that because recently we um, received funding to help us grow our capacity through the MacArthur Foundation. We received a grant. So 
um, that is allowing us to build our capacity, build our, 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 our growth and, and help individuals who wanna be a part of this campaign, reach out to them and start, and start those partnerships. So um, right now it's not as big as Black Lives Matter, like I said, but we, we do have people in different states that are doing the work and that we're continuing to support and, and trying to grow in those regions. Can you name some of the states? It doesn't have to be a complete list if it's just off the top of your head. <laughs> yeah, so I know um, we have um, one of our, our biggest uh, supporters is Lottie uh, Dula. She's located in Denver, Colorado, and she has her website, Reparations for Slavery. Um, she is a, uh, a white individual who actually tells the story of her ancestry and how her family, she had learned, you know, the, she was told her history one way and it turned out that it was another. They owned slaves and things of that nature. And so her work is telling her story and getting other people to do that same genealogy, but then also um, sort of advocating for reparations in that way. And we have uh, faith-based and ethically centered communities in, you know, Boston, New England, you know, um, New Hampshire, um, on the uh, East Coast, right, New York. So there are people so quite spread out, but uh, not sort of concentrated in one area, but we're still looking to expand and grow, especially in Georgia as well. So it's deeper to um, extend into the South, would you say? Yes, so we have um, a, one of our partners is uh, coming to the table. And so that's the uh, Richmond, Virginia area, sort of uh, because they have multiple as well, but that chapter. And then we also have the Jubilee Justice Center is one of them. Um, and we're working actually to support a petition with um, one of our uh, group friends, Pat Gunn, who is trying to get the, one of the town squares renamed because it's after an infamous uh, slaveholder and they're trying to get it renamed to support a black individual that's actually over a burial, a burial ground as well. So they're having to get petitions um, from the property owners to change the name and then also to respect that the, it's an unmarked slave burial ground for people who were there during that time. So uh, is, um, is that the ground disturbed, that burial ground? How disturbed is that? Are, are, the, are the dead still allowed to rest or is it, has it been? It was, I, think the I believe the town square was actually built over the burial ground because it was unmarked. So just sort of trying to get recognition of that and renaming the town square after a prominent slave, uh, enslaved, former enslaved African, Susan Taylor, I believe is her name, that they're trying to rename the town square. How much is the grant from the MacArthur Foundation? And are you using some of that money for the radical truth tellers? Because I see that um, uh, you said that you financed them uh, in some way so that they could share their story further, right? Yes, absolutely. So we do give the award for the rec radical truth tellers. The um, MacArthur Foundation grant was um, $750,000. And um, we award Radical Truth Tellers um, $1,000 for um, speaking with us every month uh, that whoever we nominate to help them make an impact either in their work or if they, you, you know, we have no stipulations on how they use the money. It's just whatever they needed to do their work. And do, do you know if the Truth Telling, the truth -telling Project um, uh, sent in an application for the grant or did someone nominate you? So they actually reached out to us wanting to support reparations work and truth telling. And so um, they contacted us and then extended an invitation to apply for the grant. And that's how that went. Right. C congratulations. I think um, oh, I did uh, do, do some research many, many years ago. And there's no such thing as applying for them. I think it's uh, uh, totally there. They reach out to whoever they want to help. OK, yes. Um, Concerning the radical truth tellers, uh, give us a little uh, background of that uh, program and then tell us uh, two of the most uh, notable radical truth tellers that you had and why. So I believe the idea for the radical truth teller uh, came about in response to wanting to have a rapid repair fund, right? A lot of the times when you're in uh, grassroots community organizing work, you are not necessarily um, financially stable, right? Like it, it can be um, 
very hard to sustain yourself. There are you know, different ways that people go about it, but we really wanted to offer just um, funds for individuals who needed it, who are in those situations. Um, but the, so out of the rapid repair fund, that, which is still something we're trying to build, we decided, okay, well, how about we nominate an individual, right? How about we find individuals on the ground that are doing this work that we can nominate? We can give them a platform where they can tell the story about the work that they're doing and give them a small award to, to help them in, on their way. And so um, that's how the idea of the Radical Truth Teller came about. Um, and we do it in many different areas, but it's to, to support, you know, Black uh, and community activists and people of color who are doing the work on the ground. I can't say that we have, you know, most notable, I, everyone that we sort of nominate, we try to find, you know, who, who don't have such a huge platform and people who um, could use, you know, that, that type of uplift and, and boost in, in I mean, awareness and, and contacts and things of that nature. So um, I'd say, you know, we have Tiffany Monfort Dent, Dr. Tiffany Monfort Dent, who um, has wrote a number of books and her work is going around black girls and mentorship and um, supporting their development. And we have, you know, Dr. Kaya Shivers, Kamal Bell, who is working on like a black farm, land farmers project in North Carolina. We have artists, we have people from all over the spectrum that you know are doing work from community murals to um, you know farmers indexes and just sort of highlighting the different ways you know black being represented in the media um, different ways in their work that they're trying to get the word out and, and bring awareness about you know that underrepresentation or you know black farmers or whatever the case may be. Do you know of uh, any of the other uses for the uh, foundation money for the um, that, that in other projects that uh, the the true another truth telling project um, uh, programs that are uh, using that uh, MacArthur um, fund money? Um. So, like, what other programs within the truth telling project yes. are we using? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Oh man, there are so many different things. And there are things that are in the work as well because we, we we had just awarded this grant this year. And so we're um, building our capacity, you know, creating, uh, updating our website, um, creating our program. So that's still- When, when were you awarded it? Um, and in uh, September actually of oh. this year. Yes, oh, so very, recent. very recently <laughs> did we um, receive the, the funding for that. So it's going towards having paid staff instead of only having volunteers now, right? We're able to have people, bring people on in that capacity, um, supporting interns. We're looking for interns at the moment as well, people who are looking for credit or um, sometimes students are not always able to work for free. So we're trying to offer a small stipend for interns as well. We're um, gearing up for our Reparation Sunday event this December. Um, and we are also, having a convening sort of a conference, um, a revival would you around reparations that we're planning for next year. So the funds will go towards that um, as well. We're having a, a, also a black land uh, in reparations event at the end of November on Give Tuesday. It's a fundraising event um, that we'll be promoting as well on our website and on social media. So just uh, continuing to, to grow our capacity and, and expand our reach, that's really how you're planning to use the funds. How could students uh, apply to the uh, Truth Telling Project to, for internships? So there uh, is a form on our website and I can share all of the links with you if you'd like to sort of put that out there as well for your radio station. Yeah, let me see if I could, yeah. And also let me see if I could, because we are recording this and we will put this on uh, YouTube as well. So if you if you're able to share to your screen, we could uh, you could share that too if you want. Oop, I shared the wrong one. Sorry. No, no worries. Stop share. Okay. And I'll add the link so that you can put it in the description um, for that. They can also reach out to me. My email address is latrice at grassrootsreparations.org. So, so for, feel free to send your resume there as well. And okay. is it, um, it's in the chat right now? The, your, uh, my your email, email address? Yes. Just I am it dropping again. it there. Sure. Okay. okay, repeat it again for our listeners. 
Sure. So it's Latrice, and that's spelled L-A-T-R-I-E-C-E at grassrootsreparations.org. And I am dropping that in the chat for you now. Thank you. So is one person recognized as a radical truth teller every month? Yes, we try to support one person every month. And when did this uh, project, uh, this program begin? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I want to say it started, we've been doing this for a little over a year now. It's been pretty recent, but a little over a year. And one of the things that we were um, seeking to do to expand the radical truth tellers um, is have them help and come back and speak with the events that we're hosting and also have sort of like an end of the year sort of um, recognition ceremony just to kind of update all of our followers on the work that they've done since they spoke um, and was nominated as an, a radical truth teller, you know, where they are now. So that's something that we are looking to, to start with our radical truth. Is there uh, somewhere on the website that has the, uh, the list of all the, all the radical truth tellers? I was uh, looking, looking around here. There's a lot of uh, uh, to explore on the website. So probably I didn't uh, find it yet. Um, you know what, there is, and it may not be completely updated with all of our Radical Truth Tellers, but you can see some of the people that we have hosted in the past. So um, let's see if I can actually pull up the website for you and tell you where to go. Okay. And I can share my screen as well if that would be helpful. One moment. Okay, so this is our website here. And oops, sorry. As you can see, we have Corey Bush, there's David Raglan. So if you click on programs, <clears throat> um, and if you scroll down, you'll see some of our radical truth tellers. So Dr. Tiffany Monfort Dent was one of them recently. I mentioned her earlier. Um, Willard from uh, INCOBRA, which is the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. Um, he's also one of our faith based because he works with the Unitarian Church and he helps us organize for grassroots reparations. Um, and so if you go to our programs link, you can kind of see who some of the radical truth tellers were. There's their contact information and some of the work that they have done. And then you would also use the same website um, if you're looking to apply for some of our internships as well. Okay, awesome. So there is an application for, uh, or, they, uh, or uh, students could just email you because that your, your email is there. I think yes. with, your, with your profile, right, staff? Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, all right. So do you reach out to activists or can activists apply to you uh, to become a radical truth teller? We um, reach out to activists, but we do have a nomination form as well. And I can send you that link. Um, so the nomination form, if you know of anyone who's doing work that you think would need support, you can nominate someone and we would review that information. You fill out the form and we'd contact them um, if we would like invite them to be a radical truth teller. And that uh, form is on the website as well? That form is not on the website, but I will drop it in the chat for you. Okay. Yes. Just so that you can have it and have the link to the description. Yes. Now. When we publish the YouTube video, we'll make sure that we uh, put all that in the description. Perfect. Is there a speaking circuit for the awardees? Uh, or, uh, or is it up to the, or is it just like events? Yes, yeah, so um, we don't necessarily have an official speaking circuit for them, but if there are something that we're doing, for instance, like our Black Land Reparations event that's coming at the end of November, um, we would invite some of our radical truth tellers who's working in that area to speak for that event. So, um, and they, of course, they would have invitations to speak, um, you know, to, with other places as well that's relevant for their work. But um, we, we mostly give them the platform within the Truth Telling Project and then, you know, wherever else they, they decide to go. What are your regular events uh, for the Truth Telling Project uh, throughout the year? 
Um, so our reparation Sunday, and we usually have that twice a year. One is the internet, the UN International Day um, for the recognition of like human rights and violations and things of that nature, and then Jubilee. Um, um, so Juneteenth is, is, is one uh, around there, and then in December is when we have the Jubilee, and that is where um, sort of the last um, individuals who, when, when slavery was abolished, they were um, informed that slavery was abolished much later, the people who were working in the South, like Texas and things of that nature, and they just sort of walked off the plantations, and so we sort of acknowledging that um, this year with a reparation Sunday is honoring our ancestors coming together in ceremony and uplifting um, that our community in that way. Do institutions uh, request for the truth telling project or radical truth tellers to present to them? I'm sorry, what was that? What was that? Do other uh, institutions ask uh, for the Truth Teller uh, Project to present at their institutions or at, at their organizations? Yes, absolutely. Um, the Interfaith uh, I Am for Age for Human Integrity, that's one of the ones that have reached out to us and they would like you know us to speak to their congregations. It's uh, based in California and it is a group of congregation members that come together. And so we're talking about reparations with them and things that we can do to sort of partner to support that work. Um, we also, like I mentioned, like with Lottie Dula, she speaks, she has many different speaking again, and she's one of our partners, um, the coming to the table in Cobra. So we, we do have different organizations that we partner with that we are able to reach out to. Dr. David Raglan, of course, because he's one of the main co-founders of the organization, speaks with various uh, places as well. He recently gave a talk with the uh, Duke University for the international their international peace studies. Um, department so absolutely so they have the uh, peace studies and also justice studies yeah does the true telling project have a working relationship with the media not at the moment um i know when it was first starting out they uh Corey Bush and Dr. David Raglan would be on St. Louis radio um, a lot, but not so much since that we have we don't have a strong relationship with the media, but that's something that we're looking to do <laughs> to grow. Does the True Telling Project have collaborations with foreign institutions? How extensive is um, um, uh, the necessity for truth telling in uh, countries other than the US? So we don't currently have any collaborations with uh, foreign institutions. However, um, there are truth telling and reconciliation processes that have taken a place abroad. For instance, in Canada between the indigenous people and the Canadian government for their role in boarding schools and you know the um, taking of their traditional lands. And there is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, processes that happen in South Africa, in South Africa with apartheid and sort of um, bringing together the people who uh, were impacted by that, right? The, the people who, who were given the land and were given the business and were able to profit from that institution and those who were disenfranchised. So um, I think that the conversation is very relevant, especially as we see more and more divide racially, uh, you know, with the the Palestinian and, and conflict and things of that nature. Um, it, it, it's a human rights issue, right? It's, it's racism, the way that it shows up in America is through racism and slavery, but it'll look different um, depending on the context in different countries. And so I would say that there definitely is a need for truth telling and reconciliation processes abroad. Um, it'll just look different for those different groups. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that um, there's an event with the UN so how is the True Telling Project working with the UN? So um, we don't necessarily have a direct partnership with the UN, but some of the days that they recognize in regards to human rights valid, um, violations is what we honor. W what we follow is sort of their articles of, um, uh, when it comes to human rights violations, like their reconciliation and the in the best way to go about that, and so we 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 talk about that in one, in our reparations course, right? Guarantees of non-repeat, restitution, what that means for um, 
in, in terms of reconciliation. And so we, we just kind of use that as a guiding factor when we're talking about our work and the best way to sort of go about uh, healing communities and moving forward. You mentioned and then repeat. So um, how does that fit in? Is it that um, uh, because uh, the truth has been told and more people recognize the truth then hopefully uh, what happened won't to repeat? Is that what you mean by non-repeat in the reparations uh, bills? So guarantees of non-repeat is just um, when you're trying to, uh, or, I'm trying to figure out the right word, to, when you're trying to, to reach that reconciliation pro process, right? It's making sure that the harms, the abuses through the truth telling, what was the crimes that were committed, the, the human rights violations don't continue, right? So you're trying to reach a, an agreement, you're trying to reach a process of healing and understanding that what happened before will not happen again. And so that's what the guarantee of non-repeat comes from, right? We're not, you're, you're not going to allow for this type of thing to continue. And what, what can we implement now so that it doesn't happen in the future? This is WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM. And we have with us at Wizard, Latrice Clark of the Truth Telling Project. And we will continue our interview with her. And um, um, this uh, truth telling and uh, how to address uh, police violence. Then, um, uh, guarantees of uh, uh, non-repeat, are, are they uh, applicable? Have they been applicable to uh, any uh, agreements in the US uh, that you know of that maybe have uh, worked with the Truth Telling Project or incorporated, uh, incorporated their, uh, your, your principles uh, to the work? Are there any processes currently going on that's doing so? Yes, those? yes. So are there any successes? Because of course, uh, it's, it's an ongoing problem. And I, I know that we're, you're trying to address the status quo, but are there any places um, uh, in the US that were, were that the uh, process is uh, working? And, uh, and uh, I, well, in Chicago, there's the consent decree. You know, we shall see how, how that actually changes uh, everything, but of course it's in the process of being implemented. But uh, have do you know of any successes with all the work that you're doing in the U.S. because of your work? So I believe, I would say that it's an ongoing process, just like you said. There are um, different initiatives that are, are are taking place, especially in regards to reparations, right? We have um, the bill that was passed in Evanston, right? That, that was looking to help individuals um, of the black community that are living there with purchasing a home. So they set aside funds for that. There um, has been Asheville, right? And then recently we have universities that have come forth that were willing to dedicate um, free tuition or um, you know, acknowledging their role of having had slaves help build their ed their educational institution, and they're looking for ways to, to rectify that. I know Georgetown and Brown University are, are two that have done that. So there there are things that are happening uh, for what what's becoming more and more prevalent. However, I I, I have not seen um, yet a, a a case where that has that's come to completion. It's it's something that's still in the works and people are still trying to figure out the best way to go about it and how to, to serve the community, their community in regards to reparation treatment. So right now there's some um, ongoing work uh, toward reparations uh, uh, with the Truth Telling Project and uh, you know, the ramifications from the Truth Telling Project. Do you know of any ramifications from the Truth Telling Project that uh, uh, address uh, alleviating the police violence, and uh, and it seems as if it's the wanton disregard for human life in uh, in a lot of in most of the incidents that uh, the family members describe. So there um, is the movement to abolish, you know, prisons and abolish, um, you know, police as as an institution that are is contributing to, you know, they say slavery, uh, prison, you know, and having people go through that system is modern day slavery. And so um, within the truth telling project, you were saying, is there any uh, partnerships within the truth Project 
project around that? Uh, actually, um, all your work, I, you've, uh, let's say, uh, you, you started in earnest, everything gelled together in 2017. So now it's 2021. So it's about four years of work. Uh, have there uh, been any uh, instances uh, in the US where because of your work, uh, uh, there, there has been uh, a, a push to address police violence and against uh, persons of color, uh, address the racial profiling uh, in earnest uh, that uh, we have seen at least the uh, earnest, er, if it hasn't been implemented totally yet, is it uh, in the process of being implemented? in the process of being, yes, I would say it's definitely in the process of being implemented. Um, the work of the Truth Telling Project has evolved, right? And so um, our, our focus in terms of these different areas, right? Police violence, truth telling, um, you know, it's time to listen, creating that curriculum to teach it in schools and um, the grassroots reparations campaign. We, we have people on our board that are doing that work. We have people within our organization, right? Um, people that we support on the ground. And we're just now at a, at a point where we're able to sort of track, okay, what is the result of that, right? Like I said, we were just recently funded. We were before on a volunteer basis. And so, um, but still pretty new in, in regards to you know, where, where we're at with things. And, and we have recently have um, a national organizer who has worked on Corey Bush's campaign, sort of helping us organize and operations um, in regards to, you know, where are our people and how are we able to uh, keep this community um, and support them moving forward. And so we're, we're still kind of in the beginning stages of processing what, what is our reach? What is our impact? You know, what are some of the things that people are doing aside from our, our community partners that have reached out to us and, and you know, we know or, or have been doing the work? I'm also a master's student. And uh, what we've learned in class is that um, uh, structured racism or anything that's um, uh, so embedded in the status quo will not change unless uh, uh, people vote. And uh, so does um, uh, the truth telling project spend any of the funds to increase voter turnouts because it seems as if it's, uh, uh, it's the status quo will change only if uh, the voter turnout uh, uh, increases substantially. Mm. We do not do any work um, in regards to voter turnout directly. That isn't something that, um, you know, just historically we have pushed for. However, um, we do recognize the importance of that. And recently we've had talks within the campaign about how we can kind of support and, and, and sort of have that, make that more of an awareness, right? With truth telling processes and how that, and coinciding that with, with voter turnout. And so we don't currently have any programs around that, but that is definitely something that we can look for towards in the future of how we can support that. Do you know of any organizations that, that you are working with that um, uh, try to increase voter turnout to address the status quo, address this, uh, address this uh, structured racism? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any organizations that um, we partner with per se that, that's doing that work. Um, not to say that there aren't, just that hasn't just been the, at the forefront of any of the conversations I've been a part of. So. Yeah, Christine, uh, yeah. Christine Hendricks uh, said in 2015 in the, one of the uh, YouTube videos that uh, of, uh, of your events that the whole damn system is as guilty as hell and needs to be torn down because its foundation is based on structural uh, racism. So is the True Telling Project developing by now uh, after, uh, after all these years? I know there's still a lot of work to be done, but is the True Telling Project developing any solutions to structural racism? Yeah, so one of the things that we have been pushing for um, is building a, a culture of reputation. And so what that means oftentimes is, you know, 
we, we see that more as the, just, just writing a check, right? Sometimes, oh, we, we, we just want to look at it that way. But we really want people to hold themselves accountable to changing their actions and being complicit, right? We're all complicit in the system that's allowing structural racism and things to continue, right? So if that means just best disinvesting from, um, you know, institutions that are supporting, for instance, the pipeline. Uh, disinvesting from institutions that are not willing to pay their workers a fair wage, right? So whatever that looks like um, for that individual, we are encouraging them to hold themselves accountable and, and build that culture of reparations, right? It can be on the community level, it can be on the individual level, but just what, wherever your capacity lies, committing to holding yourself accountable to not remain complicit. And so that's the way that we are trying to um, push for change in addition to our political education and events and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, collaborating with any uh, institution to uh, help this, um, to implement this uh, possible solution of uh, making people more aware of uh, holding themselves accountable for, uh, for change? Yeah, so um, some of the partners that I've mentioned earlier, like NCOBRA, um, you know, Coming to the Table, the Jubilee Justice Center, um, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, um, the Reparations for Slavery. We, we do partner with um, a number of organizations and then we have um, people who are not necessarily on the faith-based side, but um, like Lynn Layton, for instance, she's a part of the um, psychologist who's a part of the um, APA section nine. And so she has organizes individuals in that realm as well as the Boston's workers circle. Um, so people who are part of different groups locally, they organize and talk about our work as well to help build that culture. So right now it's uh, still St. Louis that has the strongest uh, presence of uh, the True Telling Project. Um, as of right now, I would say, especially with Con uh, Corey Bush becoming the congressperson, it's been less uh, based in St. Louis. We have people, especially with COVID and things, and everyone's working from home. We're all over. However, um, we do still want to have that strong connection to St. Louis and Ferguson and, and the people on the ground. So we have people on our board who um, are still based there. And we are um, trying to keep that connection through them and through those community activists. Is the True Telling Project under the fiscal sponsorship of the NEIU Foundation? Yes. Does the True Telling Project have collaborations and connections with uh, other foundations for fiscal sponsorships? Um, no, we do not. NAIU is the only foundation that we have worked with outside of getting the grant from the MacArthur Foundation. <laughs> Can you enlighten us about how uh, the True Telling Project came to uh, work with NAIU? Yeah, so um, uh, David, uh, one of the co-founders, Dr. David Raglan, actually um, met one uh, who's Chris Tofalo, she works with NEIU and she's the board treasurer for our organization. They met at a peace summit. And so I believe through their collaboration or she was on the ground in Ferguson actually, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but once they met and she uh, was part of that um, movement, I believe she brought it back to NEIU as a suggestion to um, physically, physically sponsor the Truth Telling Project, the non so uh, right now, the True Telling Project's, uh, Project is in the process of uh, uh, getting its uh, 501c3 status. Um, I don't know if we're in the process of that or if we're, because with um, us being a part of the foundation, they kind of hold that. So we're not looking to move into, uh, unless we were looking to move into, in, to be an independent um nonprofit, then that would be when we would make that move. But for right now, since they're still our, our fiscal sponsor, that's not something that we're moving towards at the moment. Let's do a WZRD community assessment with you. WZRD Chicago, being a nonprofit radio station, must be responsible to the community we serve. WZRD is mandated to file quarterly issues with the FCC on non-entertainment community-focused programming. 
So we like to assess the community for these quarterly issue topics with three questions. First, what is most important to you? It doesn't have to be centered on the truth telling project. It's uh, just what is most important to you as a person. Um, I would say I am definitely a humanist. I feel relationships are most important, right? How we interact with one another and how we treat one another. And um, I think that's sort of partially what brought me to this work, right? My, my interest in human nature, my background's in psychology. That's what I'm going to school for. So um, I, I'm, I'm in, my, most important to me is the relationship. So how has the um, uh, True Telling Project uh, changed you? Uh, when did you start uh, becoming involved? And um, you know, how, from that time till now, how has the project changed you? Um, so I started volunteering with the Truth Telling Project in 2017 on and off while I was starting my PhD program. And I would say one of the ways that it's been most impactful to me um, is just witnessing the, um, how do I say, witnessing on both sides, right? The, the, the staff within the organization, but then also the community members that we work with, their dedication, right? Their, their drive, their commitment, and then the impact of that on our constituents, right? On people who come to us and they're like, I, you know, after taking a course, oh, that really, you know, I really learned a lot. It really opened my eyes. Just hearing those testimonials from folks um, is, is something that's kept me motivated, right? It's like, okay, we're seeing the impact, we're seeing the results, it's, we're, we're getting somewhere, however slow that may be. Um, but that that's kind of what has impacted me the most. It has the, it has the uh, community, it has the, uh people in charge of the of, uh, implementing the truth telling project are they mostly uh, college professors and uh, and uh, uh, university institutional um, people um, I wouldn't say everyone. Of course, one of the co-founders, like Dr. Ragland, you know, he is a scholar. Um, and one of the other co-directors is actually a retired um, professor of women's studies. Um, her name is Melinda Salazar. Um, but, you, you know, people on our board, we have a wide range of people who are scholars, people who are community activists and not necessarily consider themselves scholars. Um, and then people that uh, participate in our events the same. Right, it's not always people in academia. We we try to keep it, um, you know, a well-rounded group of individuals to to have a diverse perspective and, and decision making in this nature. What long-term problem must we address? Oh, one. <laughs> There's so many. Um, what long-term problem? I, I would definitely say his, the history of racism in this country is something that continues to impact a large percentage of our population. And, um, you know, we have yet to receive a lot of the um, attention that other groups receive and sort of some of the results in terms of policy um, and uh, just the conversation even around reparations, right? It's always something that it causes tension and doesn't necessarily re, uh, is well received. And so just changing our culture around that, right? When it comes to people of color, there is, um, you know, clearly research, there's clearly, you know, language and um, thing, things within history that we can point to that demonstrate our disadvantages. However, when it comes to rectifying, right? There are people who are doing great work, but we just can't seem to reach a consensus on on repair. And so um, I would say that would be one of the things that we can look at as a longstanding problem to correct. Yes, absolutely. What problem must be addressed now? What problem must be addressed now? Um, all of them. <laughs> That's a very difficult question. Um, what problem needs to be addressed now? There, I just, I can't point to one thing that's such a heart to 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 manage. Um, I would say 
going back to the conversation about voter turnout, I think that there is a lot of hesitant, people hesitate to trust the government for various reasons, right? In terms of having the people's best interest in heart at heart, instead of it being based on, you know, corporate interests and um, certain groups' interests. And so if we were able to repair democracy, a true democracy, and having people feel like their participation matters and that their voice is actually being heard, that that's something that would contribute to um, healing in, in our culture in America as well. Yeah, that seems to be uh, very fitting because uh, if uh, people assume that uh, their vote doesn't count, then they don't vote. And of course, <laughs> their, uh, uh, what they think does not count because it's not helping to, uh, to elect the, the people, the public service who could help them. And exactly. then of course, yes. And, uh, uh, and then if they're uh, complaining that uh, uh, it's the government interest and the corporate interest that are that uh, that are holding sway, then and they don't vote, then of course that ends up as uh, the government interest and the corporate interest holding sway. Exactly, exactly. So if people are not don't feel empowered, then they don't feel like, you know, their voice matters or that they can really make an impact and make a change, then that's a way of being complicit, right? That's it's contributing to the status quo and maintaining the status quo. So um, being able to change people's attitudes around that by actually having action behind it, right? Um, not just for show, but sort of having public servants who um, really are looking out for the people's best interest and are fighting for that. People like AOC, right? Cori Bush in Congress. Um, I think that that would help. And um, there was something uh, kind of like slipped my mind, but I didn't write it down. But um, um, when um, in in the in in your work uh, to um, uh, for for truth telling, do you see that uh, uh, that uh, helps convince people that uh, to understand better that uh, the F, the truth is being told and uh, and their voices matter? Is uh, do you feel any step toward overcoming this reluctance to vote? In in that uh, uh, more people are are seeing that because uh, through the truth telling project, more of the truth is being told. That, uh, that their their voice and they matter and um, maybe their vote matters as well. Any any progress toward this and so far that you could see? Um, I would say that the individuals that um, that are take an interest in the truth telling project and support our work, they definitely feel that way. They definitely um, are people who are looking to organize other people, right? And bring them under the, the fold, having those top, willing to have those tough conversations and are willing to bring these issues to the forefront in their community. And the, we, we aim to support them in that work, right? So through our programs, through um, our, our organizing and activism, we, we try to uplift and maintain those grassroots efforts so that we can continue to build that culture of repair and, and, and grow to a place to heal. Do you have any uh, surveys uh, uh, for, for people, for supporters? Uh, because if you do, then maybe you could uh, ask, ask them, has, uh, has your involvement with the Truth Telling Project uh, uh, helped you uh, uh, decide to vote if you have not uh, voted before? We don't have any surveys specifically around voting, but we do uh, have like about with our course evaluations for reparations or any of the programs that we do, we try to get feedback from our constituents on how we can improve it, what things, what are things that they would like to see, um, what are some things that we can include, how can, you know, we're always looking to um, improve and stay abreast uh, on, you know, what people are doing in the movement so that we can continue to be a resource. And uh, do you have any idea about uh, how 
the truth telling project has grown uh, from how many how big was the membership before to versus what it is today so we don't necessarily have like a membership base per se that's something that we have gone back and forth about in terms of um, creating however um, our our partnerships in the who the 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 different institutions that we collaborate with, they we have individuals that approach us from, from there, right? So the work that they do comes back to us and we're able to continue to do that work because the, the word is spreading that way. So um, I don't have like a specific measure because like I said, we're in the process of developing that now since we got this grant. However, uh, more to come, right? Stay tuned. We'll definitely be able to get back to you on that shortly. Maybe, maybe uh, an easy way to answer this question is to just um, kind of eyeball how much has your email list grown, the, the, the True Telling Project email list? Oh, I see. Yes. Um, oh, wow. It, it's definitely uh, from, from what I've seen, because we have our Truth Telling Project and the Grassroots Reparations Campaign. And so um, the subscribers for that has, has been around, I want to say like 15,000. So it, it's grown a lot, definitely grown um, from when we first started. I, I don't know what it was when we first started because I came onto the campaign later, but um, since I've been here, I, I've seen that, that increase. Awesome. Well, thank you, Latrice Clark of the Truth Telling Project for joining us on WZRD Chicago 88.3 FM and sharing your insights on, uh, on the Truth Telling Project and uh, structural racism. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you.